Hello and welcome to Django on Docker. In this one, we're going to be covering Heroku and OpenCV deployment. That is having OpenCV working with Django at the same time on Heroku. Now, if you aren't familiar, Heroku has a very hard limit of 500 megabytes for its standard deployment, as in its non-container deployment. So in this one, we're going to show you how to have a pretty large container by having OpenCV in there and actually deploying that to Heroku services to actually get our Django project on there and working with OpenCV natively. And before we jump in, I do recommend that you watch this video. Now, this video does have a post associated to it, but the idea is if you can get through that video, no problem. That is doing a very simple container using Django and Docker. If you can do that, no problem. This shouldn't be much of a stretch either. So let's go ahead and jump in. Now, of course, the related guide is here. So if I go too fast or if I lose you in a part, just check out that guide because that's going to be the most up to date. And it's also going to take you in the same steps, but in a much more thought out and structured format than this video. I kind of just like doing videos and not scripting them out. So it doesn't sound robotic. I feel like when I'm reading something, I sound robotic. So in any ways, um, this blog post in the long run is going to be the one that's updated more often than the actual video, which hopefully makes sense as to why. Now, um, the main difference between this one and the Django on Docker, the one without the deployment to Heroku, um, is this Docker file. That's pretty much the only difference in the final project structure. The Docker file itself will change a little bit, and then we'll also add in some shortcut scripts to actually deploy this to Heroku so you don't have to memorize too much stuff. I, I, I love getting in that habit. Um, so the first few steps I'm just going to get blow by. First one is just getting our old Django on Docker project locally and then verify that it's working. That's only Django related stuff and our virtual environment. Next is actually getting that with Docker working locally. Same thing. Um, it's just stuff that you should be in the habit of checking and making sure that it's running. Um, so I will go through this, but I'm going to go through it pretty quick because we want to get to the meat of this stuff. Now, I'm going to assume that you have Docker running. You have a Heroku account. That's, of course, Heroku, Heroku.com. Get an account there and download the command line interface, which is also up there. Of course, Windows 10 Pro and Mac OS, these are required systems. If you don't have them, this is Docker is probably not going to be for you. OK, so. Let's go ahead and get our Django project working locally. Open up Terminal or PowerShell, depending on what system you're on. And we're gonna go ahead and CD into our dev folder. I'm gonna make a directory. In my case, I'm gonna call this DJ Heroku Docker. And I'll CD into DJ Heroku Docker. Yes, Windows users, you can't use an and like that. Okay, so uh, with this, I'm gonna go ahead and do a clone of my Django on Docker project. And of course, at this point, you might be like, hey, can I use that other project that I just finished? Yes, you absolutely can. You don't have to do what I'm doing here. I keep these things separate. So at the end of the day, after the whole series is done, you can see each repository in of itself by itself. So it works on its own. That I think is really important while you're learning is to be able to see the code that I actually created through this process next to the actual guide. Okay, cool. So now that we've got that, I'm gonna go ahead and just do a pip env install. This of course is gonna get all of my virtual environment related things for this project. Um, I would also like to note that I often divert from the names. I think this is called DJ Docker to Heroku and I just called it DJ Heroku Doctor. Docker, um, it, it, it doesn't matter, right? You can name these things however you like. Just keep that in mind. Whenever it comes to software, somebody made up the name somewhere. You can change things unless there's like strict requirements, which we will talk about when, when it's necessary about those strict requirements. Now, of course, you can verify that um, it's working locally in just a virtual environment. I'm gonna just go ahead and hit enter. If I don't see any errors here, I'm in, good, in a good spot. I'm not gonna actually verify this URL because I don't really care about that working right now. Of course, this is gonna be an opportunity to build out your Django project. 
but that's not why we're here. We're here to get uh, Django on Docker working in Heroku. So the next step is let's just verify that Docker is there. No big deal. I definitely already have Docker installed. Uh, and then I could actually build it out if I wanted to. I am not going to build it out and I'm not gonna run that container at this point because we're here to deploy Django on Heroku. Okay, so of course you wanna make sure your Heroku version is correct. Uh, I got some version stuff in here, some issues. So I'm just gonna go ahead and check this with sudo. And gotta type your password right. Okay, cool, I got my version stuff fine. Um, cool. So next step is to actually create a project on Heroku. So I'm just going to do Heroku create DJ Heroku Docker. Okay. Um, now of course yours is going to be different than that because I just claimed that name. So that is now my project name. Okay. So the next thing is we actually need to log in to Heroku's container registry. So let's go ahead and log do Heroku container colon login. I'm gonna log in here. Now the purpose of this is when you actually build a container image, you need to push that somewhere. In our case, we're gonna be pushing it to the Heroku container registry. You can also push that stuff into the Google Cloud's container registry. You can push it into Docker uh, has its own service for a container registry. You can push it in a lot of places. It's, an, it's similar in a way to a GitHub repository for your Docker container. Uh, but I don't know if there's a way to actually reverse it. Like, I don't know if you can grab a container from the registry and actually unpack it and get all the code that went into it. I, I, I don't, that, that, that'd be a good question to find out. So the next thing is adding in a database. So our production Django project actually has a place to store our data and something that's fault tolerant and actually ready for production, right? So Django ships with SQLite, that's not exactly a production database. The other thing is when you use containers, when you use Docker, the databases don't persist. That is if a container goes down, the database, if it's on that container, also goes down. Now, if I lost you there, just 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 have your production database outside of your container, just in a completely different spot, um, because Django can connect to it as long as there's an inter internet connection to that, or or some sort of connection to that d database, it will be completely fine. So in my case, I'm going to be using Heroku's built-in free Postgres SQL database service, but you could use um, AWS's RDS database if you wanted. You would just have to have the correct settings to allow that to happen. Um, but in my case, I'm going to obviously be using Heroku's free service for this uh, by just adding it into my app. So the the key part of this actual command is not the first part. You, could, you can look that up. That's super easy. It's actually the last part is appending our actual name of our project here, right? So typically when you're using Git, you won't have to do this. But in my case, I'm just gonna declare the actual app name that I have. In my case, it's dj-heroku-docker, as we see right here. We hit enter, and it's gonna create this database for me. Of course, it's gonna be a blank database, an empty database. That's okay. Um, I guess right now is a good time to say, hey, you see all this stuff? This is just permissions errors. Um, it's working fine for me, so I'm just gonna keep going. So don't worry if you're not seeing these permissions errors. It's probably because I'm using two different root users and that's probably why. Okay, so the next thing is updating our Django database settings. Um, hopefully not a huge surprise here as far as Django is concerned is we need to have our database settings set up to work with our newly created Heroku database. So let's go ahead and copy this and we're gonna bring it into our project. I'm gonna go ahead and do open period. And of course, if you're on Windows, it's just II period. That will open up the directory. And then we're gonna open up our settings file in any text editor that you want. In my case, I'm using Sublime Text. Um, and I'm gonna scroll down to where my database, my initial database configuration is. Now, of course, this is a good time to mention 
the way I have this settings.py is not necessarily best practice for going into production. Again, I'm not trying to spend a lot of time on Django specifically, but more about the infrastructure it takes to get this whole project going. Best practices for Django and the settings files are not this. I'll just say that much. If you wanna know more about that specifically, let me know in the comments and maybe I can revisit this uh, on another video. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next part, which is actually updating our dependencies for our new project, right? So we need our DJ database URL. So this stuff related to Heroku and then the PostgreSQL Python library. So we're gonna go ahead and add those in after we save our settings.py file, open up terminal again. And again, I'm still in the root of my project where the pip file is, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and run pip env install those two requirements. Okay, so depending on what system you're in, the Postgres library might fail on you, right? So you might have to have Postgres installed on your system. You might have to use a different requirement or a different installation than what's on there. It's certainly possible. I've definitely come across it enough to at least make that note. If you're still having issues, Google it and find on Stack Overflow or something like that um, that will solve for your system and then post that in the comments. It helps other people so much if you find that specific error or solution. It looks like mine actually is gonna be failing. So I will have to probably do another solution I know about, which I will say in just a moment too. Um, so while that, okay, it did fail. Cool, so this is good to see. So what I'm gonna do then is just do dash binary. And this is a, another option for the PostgreSQL installation. So if that succeeds, then we're in good shape. If it doesn't su succeed, then we'll have to come back and, and come with some solution. Um, but the first one you're gonna wanna try is the first one I tried, and then you would wanna go to the binary, and then you would probably wanna do that Google search and hopefully find an answer for others. Okay, so I had it fail yet again. So what I'm gonna do is, yet again, I will open this up and open up my pip file here. And I see that I still have that initial one in there. So I'm gonna delete that. And then I'm also going to just delete my pip file.lock. Sometimes that creates issues for this. And then once again, I will run that install. This shouldn't actually change my pip file again because I already have those in there. Um, so you could have just ran pip, inst pip env install. Looks like that solved it, okay. Cool, so um, let's go ahead and go back. We've got all that installed. And of course I could verify that this is running again by going back into this run gunicorn command. Um, now the reason I might wanna do this, it has to do with um, if the database were to fail, right? So, so in this case it actually did work, um, just has the wrong host or not an allowed host. So let's go ahead and add that one in. In our settings, I'm just gonna go ahead and add this. Again, this is not going into production best practices for Django. I'm just trying to get some of this stuff to work so you can see how it does. Okay, cool. So I was able to actually go to the admin um, without any major errors. Okay, so naturally the next thing really would be pip env run python manage.py migrate. This should actually give me uh, an error if I didn't have um, DJ database URL. So if I wasn't using this right here, right? So if this wasn't actually in here, if it was a, a hard coded um, endpoint for our my SQL or Postgres SQL database, um, I would have had errors right there because it probably wouldn't have worked. Okay but it did work. So let's go back into our guide. And now we have to update our Docker file to be Heroku ready. Now this is one of the unfortunate parts I think about deploying to Heroku is Heroku doesn't support a lot of the standard practices that many Docker files have. 
So specifically, if we look at ours, let's go ahead and open this directory again and drag that into Sublime Text. And one of the big ones is Heroku handles the actual port here. So um, the dollar sign port is set by Heroku. Okay. Uh, and then finally, the expose, we would actually want to comment that one out because, again, Heroku handles the port. So in our Docker file, we don't want to expose anything at all. Um, so it, it will do it on its own, which is really, in a way, it's really nice, but it's also a tad bit frustrating because it's a little different than other things. And that's what happens when you are working in somebody else's system. You have to work by their rules. And this is one of them that is very strict. So the other thing that's very strict about Heroku is the name of the file. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually copy the Docker file with CP to Docker file dash local. And then I'll go ahead and open Docker file dash local. Uh, I do not wanna open it there. So let's go back into my directory here and let's open this one back up. And of course, I'm gonna go ahead and keep everything exposed. Okay, so the reason I have those two is for one, the Docker file local is now our original Docker file because when we run our own um, Docker build and then we tag it, we can actually declare a specific file. So like DJ uh, Docker to Heroku, and then we say file, and I can say Docker file dash local, right? Uh, and then period. So this would actually build it based off of that local file, whatever we do in that local file too. Uh, unfortunately with Heroku, it won't work that way. It actually has to be that Docker file. That's another thing that Heroku demands when you, when you actually push it. That I would imagine is gonna change. I would imagine that they're gonna allow for different kinds of Docker files because it's, um, rather frustrating to have to use specifically Dockerfile for Heroku. Like, why do they get Dockerfile? You know what I mean? Uh, but anyways, that, that's okay. Just an important thing to note. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna get rid of dash local and actually build this out. So before I put OpenCV in, I'm gonna go ahead and deploy this one to make sure I can even deploy it, right? Because there are definitely gonna be issues. There might be steps that you missed. Maybe I went too fast. You know, whatever it is, um, we want to test it out without any additional add-ons to our Docker file or our entire project. Like, I just did some minor, minor changes. So let's go ahead and try it out. I'm going to let this build. Uh, and while it's building, I'll go ahead and talk about the next step. So if we look back into our guide here, we just kind of went through over this one and we're building it and then we will be pushing this out. Okay, so the next thing is the name here. So this has to be named web. If you're gonna use a worker, you have to use worker. So like if you were gonna have a celery and redis sort of worker, um, you would call that worker and it would be a different container most likely. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and push this out with web and of course appending whatever that app name is. And I am gonna to have to scroll back up to remember what that app name is because I didn't write it down. Uh, let's see here, scrolling really far up there. Okay, I probably could press up a couple times instead to actually find it. I can't believe I missed that. Okay, so DJ-Heroku-Docker, cool. So, um, Mine was successfully built. It went pretty quickly. So now it's time to actually deploy it. And it's really simple. It's just Heroku container push web and then the name of our application. Okay. And then you hit enter and it's going to build this again. It builds out several things into the repository. All of the various um, dependencies for this container are going to be packaged up in their own way to be on Heroku's registry. And this is part of the reason why we can deploy much bigger applications 
um, onto Heroku is that it's kind of pieced out into these different containers and then they're kind of pulled together after they're already in the registry. Uh, or at least that's how I understand it, if that even makes sense. Uh, but while that's being pushed, let's go ahead and take a look at what the next step is. And that's simply just releasing it. So, so from here on out, if you don't have to change the Docker file very much, um, the process in my mind is you're going to build it. Perhaps you test it locally with that new Heroku one as well. Then you're going to go ahead and push it. And then you're going to release it. And then finally, you'll run any sort of migrations that you need to do or create super user um, to make sure that your production database matches your local database or however you end up working on that. Uh, and, and that's really it, right? So that's kind of the, the core of all this, but th there's a number of steps to just get here. And that's, you know, that's why we have this guide. So I'm gonna let this finish. So naturally it's still finishing, but something to note, look at this one piece of this entire container is already over 500 megabytes. It's already over the standard slug limit to what you can push to Heroku. And when I say the slug limit is if you use Git to deploy, that's G-I-T, to deploy your project to Heroku, 500 megabytes is the limit right now. Uh, and, and this container already is past that, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so now it's done, let's go ahead and release it. So again, it's, it's, it's very similar. Instead of container push, it's container release. And this ideally will release our project, if we're lucky. So let's go ahead and do Heroku open, and then our app, DJ Heroku dash Docker. Um, and then hopefully we don't see any application errors. If we see application errors, that might be a problem, but we can always diagnose those errors if they do happen. Um, I don't have any. Now, a big part of the reason I don't have any is because I have debug equals to true, right? That is terrible for production, absolutely terrible. But again, I'm not talking about the best practices for production with Django here. You typically want to have debug as false. That is a given. But we now have our Heroku app on here and it's running as a container on Heroku. So if that's all we wanted to do, we could stop here. Everything else related to Roku still exists, right? So if you wanted a custom domain, you would do it the same way you've always done it with Heroku. Uh, that's true with also uh, HTTPS um, and any other sort of Heroku add-on still works almost the same way. So if you need Redis, same thing. You just provision it just like we did with the Postgres SQL database and you do all that. So if there's anything you want specifically related to Django, uh, Docker, containers, and Heroku, let me know. Otherwise, let's actually keep going to doing a few more things that you might need to do while you're building stuff on Heroku. Now, a natural one is to do the Heroku run command, right? So you've, you may have seen this already. Uh, in our case, we absolutely want to do it, and that's Heroku run and then I also want to declare Python 3. Uh, Python, I'm not sure if I even installed it. Python 2, that is. So I'm just going to declare Python 3. And then manage.py migrate. And then, of course, my app. And that was dj-heroku-docker. We hit enter. This should run the migrations into our production database. Um, simple stuff as far as Django is con concerned. Uh, the next thing is, of course, getting into the Heroku Bash. This is not a big deal either. Uh, while that's running, I'll just go ahead and open up a new environment here and go to DJ Heroku Docker, pip env shell, and then Heroku run bash, and then my app, and that's CFE, Her or no, that's DJ Heroku Docker. And this will give me a bash shell into my container. Right, so it's going to actually allow me to to run any sorts of things inside of, you know, that container on production. Now, it does take a little while, and I think that has to do with the fact that it's in a container and the fact that it's a free tier. Like Heroku's free tier is generous for sure, but it's not necessarily the highest performing server there is, right? Um, so let's go ahead and just type Python. In this case, it actually does go into 3.6. 
um, if you used a different version in Docker, naturally that version would show up. So I actually could have done Python instead of doing, uh, you know, Python uh, three over here. So that's cool. Uh, but if I import CV two, as in open CV, of course, it's going to say it has no module name that. Uh, but this would be a way to actually test that on your actual server. Like, hey, is this even in there? Um, so that's something we absolutely, absolutely want to do. So I'm going to exit out of Python and then the actual bash um, from that server. And then I want to have deploy scripts. So the reason you do this is so you don't have to memorize all of these commands all of the time, because there's a lot of them. There's Docker, there's Heroku, and then there's even Django commands, and then maybe some other commands that you want to run. Um, so I always make these deploy scripts to just simplify this process. And if there's anything that ever breaks down in it, I know what's going on. These are all just bash shell scripts, like all of the commands that I've been running. That's what all of these are. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new um, file here, and I'm going to call it deploy.sh. And I'm literally going to copy and paste this stuff in. Of course, I need to change my app name to the correct app name. And you would have to do that as well. OK. And um, running migrations, this is something I learned after many, many headaches. Every once in a while, you change something locally, and then you push it into production, and you forget to run your migrations. Man, that is just such a bummer. Um, so of course, you can run these migrations on your production database locally, but oftentimes you're, you're, you're probably not gonna want to set all of that stuff up. You'll probably just rather do something like this. Okay, so this, this .sh is specifically for Mac and Linux. So if you're on Windows, you're gonna do, um, Nano won't work for you, but you're gonna, you're gonna do PS1. So you'd open up, um, you know, your text document and using PowerShell, you'd use PS1 with quite literally the same commands, right? So the guide here says the same stuff. So naturally, again, you'd wanna change all of your different um, app name stuff. Oh, and also this is incorrect. These should be web. That will be fixed on the final post that you will see. So you'll never see what I just did, that mistake. Um, and I'm gonna assume that these are correct. Uh, so they're not all, yeah, those are correct. So cool, now we can actually try that out. And if you're on a Mac and Linux, you have to do chomod plus x deploy.sh. This is just giving permission to actually run that shell script. And you might have to use sudo in front of that, sudo chomod plus x. But now I can just run dot slash deploy just like that. And if you were on Windows, it would be the same thing, but you would just use PS1 instead of dot sh. And then it's gonna run that same exact deployment that we just did. Uh, so I'm gonna cancel this because I actually don't want that to happen because now I wanna add in OpenCV. This is like, to me, the, one of the coolest things um, that we can now do in Heroku because of Docker containers. So I'm going to go ahead and look into this bonus section here. Is it really a bonus? I don't know. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and copy this piece out. And we're going to go into our Docker file and just change these system dependencies, paste that down, and then notice that it installed environmental uh, environment dependencies as well. And that's this OpenCV contrib here. So I'm going to go ahead, get rid of all that stuff. So now I've got um, the actual binary of the OpenCV being installed and the unofficial pip3 version of that, that as well to make sure that Python works really well. Um, now, there's other ways to compile this thing out and to make it working. So by all means, change how this stuff works. But I got this working in production and it works really, really well. So I think you can do that as well. Now that I just changed that Docker file, what can I do? I can just literally hit deploy and this will change a lot of things for me. Do note that in one of our steps now, we see that OpenCV is being one of those things that's being installed and it's gonna take a lot longer because OpenCV is bigger. Uh, it's a pretty big 
package itself. And if you're not familiar with OpenCV, it's Open Computer Vision. So if you want to run facial recognition, I have a whole video on that. I'll link it in the description. Um, but if you want to actually extract faces from an uploaded image inside of Django, this is how you would do it. Now, I wouldn't recommend that that's the most efficient way to do it, but the fact that you can do it, this is one of the big benefits of using Docker and containers is that you can package up a lot more things into one single container. And quite literally, if all this Django project did was face, facial recognition, that is a complete viable little microservice that's run through Django. Now you could use Flask, which would probably be preferred to Django in this case because Flask is very narrow. Um, but the idea here is that, hey, we now know one of the biggest benefits of using one of these containers is allowing stuff like this. And, and keep in mind that OpenCV is just one little piece. We could also put in PyTorch or TensorFlow or, or many other machine learning libraries in here in conjunction with OpenCV to do a lot of these really cool things in production. Now, I'm not keeping, you know, performance still may be an issue, right? So like in production, having all those things in one container might run into performance problems, something I haven't optimized for on the lower end of these services. And realistically, if you're going to start to add in a bunch of different Python libraries, it's probably a good idea to separate those things out into their own sub microservices on their own. And now that you know how to use Docker containers, you can still use the exact same code base if you need to, to push to these different containers and different services. That starts to get a little bit hard to manage though. And that's where Kubernetes comes in to make that a lot easier if you have a lot of different containers that are essentially the same app. Um, but in my case, I could do, let's say for instance, three different services. One is for processing some of the data or pre-processing some of the data. Let's say for instance, they're images and we use OpenCV to just simply grab images that have a face in them. That's not that challenging to do with OpenCV, right? And then from there, my next actual project would identify these images. They would use something like PyTorch to actually, you know, classify what that image is or that person's face is in that example, right? And then the final one would actually be, you know, delivering those results somewhere. So that'd be three separate services and three separate completely different applications, although they all might be run through Django to actually coordinate and chat with or and talk to each other. Um, and I mean, that starts to get a little bit complicated as far as making that work well. Um, and that's where Kubernetes makes some of that stuff easier. But even like thinking in terms of like, hey, I have three different Django projects that are all going to talk to each other to handle what seems like one task. That seems weird and, and hard to imagine, but it's actually a much better way than just to try and put all of that together in one place. Uh, trust me on that. That starts to get to be very, very unmanageable very quickly. Um, so now that I've actually had it deployed, it did take a while. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and run this little test command here to make sure that I do have OpenCV installed. And you can tell by this right here. And of course, it's the app of DJ dash Heroku dash Docker. And all I'm doing here is just, you know, just testing that, hey, OpenCV is installed. Uh, I'm not actually doing anything with it. So um, a good challenge for you at this point would be to literally make three different services on three different apps on Heroku, one for OpenCV, one for something like PyTorch or FastAI, and then one that actually like calls those two things in, in, in any order that you need to actually, you know, execute something. But uh, what, what came back was 4.1.1. So that's the latest version of OpenCV and it is working. Um, I know this was a lot, but luckily we have this guide now and you can go step by step to actually get that guide and execute it. 
Um, I'm not sure if this is for everybody because it's a lot of infrastructural things, but for those of you who are wanting to do more deep learning and machine learning in production, to me, this is an absolute huge win because it's so much easier to um, push this into production than any other method. I mean, I made a whole series on how to actually do this step-by-step -step in Linux or something similar to this in Linux and all the ways you'd have to do it in Linux in the old way. Docker containers make this just super, super clean and easy, even if it doesn't feel like it. I promise you, if you went through the, my series called Hello Linux on CFE.sh, if you went through that whole thing and then came back and did this, you, your mind's going to be blown. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, this is the way to do it. I promise you that's going to be the case. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure that you subscribe to get everything on CFE.sh slash YouTube. Uh, and naturally, I put a ton of different projects on CFE.sh. I'd love to hear what you want to see next. And that is CFE.sh slash suggest. I brought that back so you can kind of put your suggestions there, upvote things or downvote things. The top suggestions there always get my attention. I have a process for working a lot of these things out. Once I master that process, then I actually start teaching it and I have to actually put it into production. I have to actually use it myself prior to ever teaching it to you. There's just really no other way. Anyways, thanks again for watching. Hope to see you next time.